ladies and gentlemen, uh, tonight's object is Messier number 57, the Ring Nebula in the constellation Lyra. That's a view of this very famous object through the Hubble Space Telescope. That's how it looks in a 8 to 10 inch Dobsonian, typical amateur telescope, at about 100 to 120 mag, so medium to pushing on medium, medium, high mag. I like to call it a Cheerio in space at star parties. That's a, that was a big hit at Glacier Point when I called it that. And uh, it's been a big hit at star parties when I say that. Now the central star is a, a white dwarf because a planetary nebula like the Ring Nebula is found when a normal sized star, one not big enough to go supernova, but uh, our, the size of our sun, maybe slightly larger, reaches the end of its useful life when it's burned out all the fuel it can it can uh, turn into fusion. Uh, it then, it doesn't explode like a supernova, but it does blow out its remaining gases. So all that's left is a, a white, small white hot core, a white dwarf. That's the central star, the original star. And then these uh, out hot out gases blow out and actually form almost like a cylinder. Uh, hmm. And this is uh, what's called a planetary nebula because when, when these were first discovered, this particular object was discovered in 1779 by Charles Messier himself, January of, 19, of 1779. And if he saw it in January, that means he was up either very, very late or very, very early because this is a summer object. Uh, so, uh, the central star is very hard to see. As you see in this uh, image, even through a 10 inch or 16 inch Dobsonian, you'll see a big view of the ring. The central star, I've only seen it just barely, and it took a 25 inch daub for me to see it. And even then it just blinked in for an instant and then went away. And that was under the dark skies of Black Butte, which are dark and clear. So it's, it's hard to see that central star. Um, mm. And it's, a, it's a something, it's a notch on your belt. It's fairly easy to find. It's right between Sula Fat and Sheliak, two uh, moderately bright, easy naked eye stars uh, in Lyra the Liar. Uh, that's uh, an interesting picture of it. That's a Spitzer Space Telescope view, it taking an infrared. The object is. <clears throat> ah, I have it here. The object is about. 2,600 light years away. Uh, its visual magnitude is 8.8, .8, so it's not naked eye. And it's, even though 8.8 .8 is theoretically binocular capable, it's very poor or almost invisible in binoculars because it just doesn't have that much of a surface brightness. Uh, the photographic magnitude is 9.7, and it's expanding at about one arc second per century. Uh, and here's a very nice view of it, final image. This is, was taken in England at the Liverpool Observatory in H alpha and also RGB filtered. So you truly get a lot of the outgassing. The famous ring portion is the, merely the brightest part, but and in dimmer, there are some dimmer, uh, less visible gases, outgasses that only show up either in infrared because they're cooler uh, or in H alpha and then a very special uh, light filtration. So it's a beautiful object. It's one of the easiest Messier objects to find because it's smack dab in the middle of the two uh, liar stars. And it's uh, one of the first things I ever found when I first got back into this hobby, when I got my first eight inch daub. This is probably the third, third or fourth thing that I found. I believe the first one was M13 and then the dumbbell, which will probably be next month's object of the month. Mm -hmm. Then this came right after it. Okay, so that is all. That's all. Uh, I do a podcast every week. Uh, it be it's effective every Wednesday through the following Tuesday. I usually record it on the weekend. Uh, runs usually twenty to thirty minutes, and it's entitled "Looking Up with Don." I did a series of podcasts on the Messe Marathon. Those are podcast number five through 11. And you go to my website, donmockholtz.com and get any of these podcasts, including 
the current one where we talk about a lot of things, including Comet Neowise. <laughs> It's not too late to realize the comet to see is Neil Wise. <laughs> I'm guessing you've had that conversation before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, many have, many have. All right, today we're going to be talking about the Messe Marathon, but we're going to begin with the Messe Charles Messier and his objects. Uh, the marathon itself, and then the final few minutes, we're going to be walking through object by object using star maps uh, for the marathon. Now, Charles Messier uh, lived and worked in Paris, France, uh, between, born in 1730, so his 300th birthday is coming up in about 10 years, and um, he, he lived until 1817. Um, okay, there. So this was the Paris Observatory where he worked out of. On the upper left, we see how it looked more or less back when he was there, 1839 after he passed away. You can see that at the right. And today you see there is no observatory, just kind of a balcony right now. Now he did discover 13 comets. Uh, 12 of them have his name on. One of them is named after Lexile who um, determined the orbit. And we can see the discovery date. These are in chronological order. On the far right, we see the instrument that he used, either a telescope or the unaided eye. And there were a couple that he found with the unaided eye. We also have the magnitude of the comet at discovery and whether it was in the morning or evening sky. EL is elongation, which is the number of degrees from the sun that it appears in the sky as seen from the earth. And then we have the right ascension and declination. Looking at the discovery dates, he did find a few in January, but he did search th throughout the year. Uh, looking at the right ascension, he, he did cover, it looked like pretty much the whole sky. And for declination from about 57.7 to furthest north, and uh, it goes down to minus 16.6. But then some of the Messe objects that he found are, are uh, south of minus 16.6. Uh, elongation. Usually we find comets uh, visually. The greatest uh, area where we find comets in the morning sky is between 50 and 60 degrees elongation. But this is in a time of competitive comet hunting in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. Back in his time, he was one of the first, we would call it competitive comet hunting. First comet was discovered in a telescope in 1680 which is like 70 years before Charles Messier. But people didn't look for comets, generally speaking, through telescopes. Um, they were doing other stuff with telescopes, surveying the sky and stuff. Charles Messier, after he missed finding Halley's Comet, began to search for new comets. Other comets were independently discovered by Charles Messier, and this does happen to comet hunters from time to time. You pick up a comet and then you report it and someone else found it before you did. Well, on the far right, we see how many days he was late. Um, he, he missed one in, in uh, 1758, then, then Halley's he missed. And, uh, and then there were a couple that were great comets. And those were those type of comets where several people see it at once. Um, they wake up in the morning and look out the window and oh, there's a comet and no one had ever seen it before. So there's so many people observing it at once uh, and discovering it that they're usually just called great comets. If someone were to go out tonight and no one had ever seen Neowise before and you look out there, you go, oh, there's a second magnitude comet, you know, then it would be known as a great comet because no one particular person actually discovered it. The last one he uh, called, he, he picked up after Pons was the first comet found by Pons. Pons went on to discover about 36 or 37 comets and found more comets visually than anyone ever. The number of comets found during Messier's comet hunting years are shown here for every five, uh, five years. And we can see some of the other discoverers who also found them, including Carol and Herschel later in the 1780s and 80s and 90s. But Messier did find and was involved in a lot of the comet discoveries. He published catalogs of the objects that he saw. 
Uh, a comet, when it's first seen through a telescope, looks like a fuzzy object. But so does a lot of other stuff. Uh, galaxies, clusters, and nebula. They can appear to be fuzzy, either with the unaided eye or with a telescope. And Charles Messier quite often used a three-inch refractor at about 100 power with a, not a real big field of view. And then he also used about a six-inch reflector that did not have a, a very shiny mirror. And he used that sometimes too. Now, the first catalog has a lot of Milky Way stuff in, a lot of bright stuff. Objects number 42, 43, 44, and 45 were kind of givens. And I'm not sure if he threw those in just to round it off to 45. I've never been figured out why 45 was a big number to him at that point. But he ended up with M45 in the first catalog, which is the Pleiades, which is pretty easy to see. The second catalog was published a few years later, and it has a lot of the fainter objects that he picked up as time went on. Now, some of the objects were so-called missing, where he said they were, they could not be found. And some of them have different definitions. So let's clear a few of the objects up. M24 is a star cloud. We can see it on the left and it's outlined on the right. It's big, it's about a degree and a half across. You can still pick it up in a C8 or a schmidt cassegrain or refractor, um, even though your field of view might be smaller than that. You can still pick it up and scan back and forth and see where it is. There's a tiny star cluster known as 6603 near the center but that is not in itself M24, and, and Messier probably never saw 6603. M40 is a double star. It's as simple as that. Charles Messier uh, had heard that there was some nebulosity involved, and he looked at it, and he didn't really think so, but he still included it as one of his objects. M47 and M48 were also missing objects until the 1940s. And then it was discovered that Charles Messier was about five degrees off in his plotting of the object. And so those two objects have been identified too. M73 is four stars. Now, Charles Messier thought he saw nebulosity in that. And under low power, sometimes you get a group of stars and it appears fuzzy. That happens to me. I've been comet hunting for 45 years. And with a 10 inch telescope at 36 power, even with the 18 inch telescope at about 100 power, I'll sometimes pick up two, three, four stars and they will appear to be fuzzy. And you, you look at it really sh as sharply as you can, even give a little bit of light to your eyes so your pupil decreases in size. And then as it opens up again, you try it, maybe you can see a little bit sharper and you try to separate those stars. And if you can't separate those stars, then it appears fuzzy. So you make a map of it and see if it moves and it doesn't move and you find out later it's just a few stars. So this does happen to the comet hunters from time to time. M91 is, is, is assumed to be a galaxy known as 4548. This to me is still somewhat of an uncertainty. Prior to the 1960s, people thought this might have been a passing comet, M91. And Charles Messier uh, plotted it. It was slowly moving. Uh, this was a night in which he picked up a bunch of galaxies. And this was the last of those galaxies that night. And he didn't go back to see if it had moved against the background stars the next day. That could be the, what exactly he saw, but we don't know. Now, if we discover a comet years from now, and it's a periodic comet, and we find out it was in that area on that night, that would answer the question. But a guy, an amateur astronomer by the name of William Williams wrote to Sky and Telescope in 1968, 1969. And he said, you know what? I think what Charles Messier did was he, he chose the wrong galaxy for his offset in measuring where M91 was. 
On the left side of the map, we have M58, and a couple degrees above, we have a little circle. That's where Charles Messier said M91 is, where that circle is. Well, let's say he was using the wrong galaxy to do his offset on his measurements. And instead of offsetting from M58, he offset from M89. Then it would go up to where we do have a galaxy, M91, which is 4548. Now that is within reach of his telescope. It is one of the fainter galaxies there. We do have one problem in that, well, it, it, maybe it's just a coincidence that it's there. A um, couple problems. One, M58 is kind of bright, M89 is not so bright. Uh, you would think he would know which one he's, he's offsetting from because they, they do look differently. The other thing is, is that as you go from right to left, increasing in right ascension, the Messier object numbers increase. 84, and then go way north off the chart, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. You know, the next one ought to be right where that open circle is. Um, so I, I don't know, but for, for most people, believe and accept the theory that M91 is 45, 48, and that's, that's probably the best we have. Again, it's possible for him to see that. It would have been bright enough, and he might have just done an offset from the wrong galaxy when he recorded it. Now, the biggest controversy in the Messe catalog is M102. Um, Messian, which, who was Messier's assistant, observed it toward the end of the catalog, and he plotted it as, um, Someone plotted it on a map, either Messier, more than likely Messier, but perhaps Messian. And then when Messian went back to observe that area, he could not find it. And um, he then assumed that he was actually looking at M101. And, and so some catalogs will say that M102 is a duplicate observation of M101. And the reason they say that is because Messian, the cold discoverer of it, said that. I think he was in an error when he said that. The difference between the two objects is almost exactly one hour of right ascension. Declination is off by a, a couple degrees, degree and a half or so. And on Charles Messier's map, uh, the right ascension is usually divided into the three sections of 20 minutes each, or about, in this case, uh, five degrees each, or a little bit less since we're further north. There is a, uh, on one of Charles Messier maps, there is an X or some type of indication where M102 is. And M102 is uh, then, seems to be a galaxy known as 5866, bright enough that Messier could have seen it. And it does look a lot different than M101. If you read the description for M101 and the description for M102, they're completely different descriptions. So whoever wrote those descriptions seems to have been looking at two different objects. Sky and Telescope does not accept that M102 is 5866. They say that M102 is M101. So they say there's only 109 Messe objects. That's what Sky and Telescope says. Astronomy Magazine accepts M102 as being 5866, but they say there is no M110. So Astronomy Magazine also says there's 109 Messe objects. Each magazine has a different, uh, same number of objects, but they're, they exclude a different object. Now, M110 was included by Glenn Jones in 1968, and he's basing it upon a drawing a map made by Charles Messier that looks like this. Here in the center we have M31, up at the top M32, but then we also have a galaxy at the bottom which is a little round circle. That is M110. Go back to the picture, that's M110. So Charles Messier did see it, he just did not catalog it. Glenn Jones added it because it's part of the Messier um, Andromeda Galaxy Complex is included in the map, and we do know that Charles Messier 
in fact saw the object. So those are the 110 objects and they are scattered throughout the sky. We have an area on the right, far right, where we have some galaxies. And then we have the Milky Way beginning at the upper right, working down, uh, down uh, and to the left, around the bottom of the map, and then back up to the right. That's the Milky Way. That's where you have the open star cluster. It's gonna take 35 minutes. Should I, should I just go pick it up? What's that? Go ahead, Don, go ahead, keep going. Okay. So we have the Milky Way going all the way around uh, this map here. That's the open star clusters, planetary nebula, and especially in the lower left portion at Sagittarius and Scorpius, we have globular clusters. Near the center where we don't have the Milky Way, we're not looking through our dust and gas, that's where we have a ton of galaxies. We also have some off, off on the far right. Now the sun, goes around uh, through these constellations every year. And here we have the path of the sun and uh, the Messe objects are plotted too, not numbered. And we have every two weeks where the sun is. When the sun is at the far right of the map and the far left of the map, we're in mid-March. And that's when the sun is obscuring the least number of Messe objects. That's the best time to do the Messe Marathon because you can see the greatest number of Messe objects in one night. I, did, uh, I started comet hunting on January 1st, 1975, and in 76 was up at Loma Prieta doing comet hunting 200 nights a year, 500 hours a year. And I, as I comet hunt, I find all the Messe objects and a lot of other stuff. And I began thinking, you know, maybe you could do something where you can see all the Messe objects or most of them in one night. For instance, my evening sky looks like this. On the far left, we have uh, M M74 at the lower left. You can't see it, but that's about where it is. M33 near the center and the Andromeda galaxy off to the right. And that would be my scene in late March um, as, as twilight comes. But also a month earlier than that, two hours later in the night, I would have the same scene. As the Earth goes around the sun, you have a different scene all the time. Here we have the evening sky in late March. The big circle around the outside here is the horizon. Everything outside that circle is below the horizon. Everything inside that circle is above the horizon. And this is a star map. If you face uh, south and hold it over your head, everything in the map orients to what's up in the sky. We have our galaxies in the west. Uh, they're setting. We have a bunch of galaxies rising in the east and a lot of Milky Way stuff uh, south and, and ahead of us. Now, we wait until the morning and all those galaxies in the east have now moved to the west, revealing new sky, what we call the summer Milky Way. And now we can pick up these objects. Uh, as the Earth moves around the sun, an object sets on the average four minutes late, uh, sooner the, each night. So at a certain time, an object will set tonight. Tomorrow night, it will set four minutes earlier. And the next night, four minutes earlier. So we have a constant change of scene going on as we go through the months. So I wrote an article for the San Jose Astronomical Association in August of 1978 saying, hey, you know, we might be able to go out and do this Messe Marathon. Let's do it next late March and um, see what we can do. At that time, using my plane sphere, which was about all I had, I didn't have planetarium programs on the computer, I wasn't real sure anyone could ever see 110 in one night. I was in San Jose, and from San Jose, you probably can't. I wasn't real sure going further south, you would be able to help yourself much. But in fact, we've learned out that you can. So at that time, uh, Sky and Telescope had a monthly column written by Walter Scott Houston, who um, passed away about 30 years ago, but he was very well known for knowing the night sky, and he had a very popular column each month in Sky and Telescope magazine. 
And so in March of 1979, just as we were preparing to do our Messe Marathon, he wrote an article about something called the Messe Marathon. And there were some people who had started it in the previous couple years, um, semi-organized, uh, kind of scattered in two or three parts of the nation. And this was the map they put in the magazine in 1979. Pretty well drawn map for that time. And we can see the evening twilight on the upper left portion of the map. Turn your head a little bit and you can see M77, 74 and 33 above the horizon. That white tail is the um, evening twilight in your horizon. As the night progresses and we get toward morning, tilt your head to the right and look to the upper right. And you can see the objects just above the, the horizon at astronomical twilight or nautical twilight. Those are the last objects you see on the Messe Marathon. Uh, a few years ago, Astronomy Magazine uh, talks about me writing the article for the forum section of the uh, March issue in 1980. I wanted to write a feature article, but they said, no, we'll just make it a, a forum article. I said, okay. So it was a shorter article than what you would have wanted, but I still wrote about the marathon and how, how you can do it. Here's the founders of the Messe Marathon. Uh, in the number of objects they found each year, and the number in red is the first time that anyone had found that many objects. It was uh, Jerry Ratley, who Jerry passed away about a year and a half ago, uh, but he lived in San Jose, and we did the Messe Marathon together several times up at Loma Prieta. And then he moved to Arizona, and it was from Arizona that Jerry Ratley was the first person to find 110 objects in one night. Since then, many, many of us have done it, but he was the first. I remember him calling me the next morning and said, Don, he said, I think I saw 110. Does it count if all I saw was the core of M30? And I said, yeah, I mean, you don't have to see all the stars. If you see the core, then you, you see the object. He says, well, then I have 110. Now, to do a successful Messe Marathon, it, it helps to have several things in your favor. We don't want a lot of light pollution. The biggest problem with a mar marathon, however, is your twilight and haze um, on the first few objects and the last few objects. Light pollution just adds to the problem. So we, we try to go places where there's not too much light pollution. We try to avoid the moon. However, I have done the Messe Marathon when the moon is three days past full. And I did that by finding all the evening objects, all 65 or so before moonrise, including the galaxies in Virgo, which were kind of faint. You get them out of the way before moonrise. And then after the moon gets up, you find in the morning all the other objects. Most of the rest of the objects are brighter. The morning sky objects are usually brighter than the evening objects. So if you have the moon in the morning sky, it's not quite as bad. But generally, we try to avoid the full moon and we try to hold it on new moon weekend. The three factors that help to determine how well you can see are, are these, in my opinion. And this works not just for the Messe Marathon, but for any extended objects. Your eyes, your skies, and the telescope. And it's probably in that order. I know you might want to buy bigger telescopes so you can see better, but work on your eyes. Uh, get good at seeing faint objects. And the more you look, the better you'll see. Skies, least amount of haze really helps. Uh, and then a telescope, larger telescopes, generally do better in the Messe Marathon only because they're better at picking up the fainter objects down near the horizon. For all the other objects, uh, almost uh, any telescope can pick them up. We like to have low horizons, but not all your horizons have to be low. In the western sky, almost exactly due west for M77 and over toward the northwest, we like to have a, a low horizon. The rest of the horizons in that 
area can be a little bit higher. On the eastern side, if you want to pick up M30, and some Messe marathons in mid-March, you know you're not going to see it, so you just forget it. But you still want to get 72 and 73. You want your east-south-eastern horizon to be low. And those two horizons, uh, if they're low, you can have a really good uh, marathon and not have any interference by the horizons. The day of the week, we usually choose Saturday night. That's kind of typically when astronomers do the Messe Marathon. I've done them almost every night of the week. And um, for a lot of people, it's an all night affair. They're up all night. Um, for many people, it's the first star party of the year, late March. They dust off their telescopes that had rainy seasons and they get out and do the marathon. It's the first time they can really socialize under the night skies. So the Messe Marathon has become a social event as much as an astronomical event. At Messe Marathons that are held by clubs, perhaps only half the people will do the Messe Marathon. Others will do other projects or just hang out. And that's, that is typical. Latitude does determine uh, the number, maximum number of objects you can see. And um, we can see the number of days that these number of objects are visible. Far right, we have 110. Uh, when you get to 30, 20, and 10 degrees, you can see 110 for a given amount of time. Probably the best latitude is about 20 degrees. When you get down to the equator and a little bit south, the objects you miss are M52. M52, the open cluster near Cassiopeia, uh, you can't see it in late March at, at the equator or actually south of the equator. So um, that's when you begin missing the northern objects. Uh, from 40 degrees, uh, it's hard to get 110. Uh, very difficult, but, but 30 degrees, 35 degrees, 37 degrees, uh, you can. I did from Colfax, well, I got 109 once from Colfax. I got 109 a lot of times from Colfax. That's at 39 degrees north. I've done a lot of Messe marathons and I've started 61 of them, I've finished 46. Uh, the others were clouded out. Um, I've learned recently, I should have known this before from what we see here, but March can be a cloudy month in the southwestern United States. I didn't know that, but I would go to the Messe Marathon in Arizona each late March and half the time it would be cloudy. Um, Northern California isn't quite so bad uh, in the March. It's either going to be clear all night or cloudy all night. But uh, here, uh, the clouds will sometimes come in at midnight. So anyway, uh, here we have my, uh, on the far left, my number of my marathon, and then the date, number of objects I saw, location, and instrument. And a lot of times early on, I used my 10-inch Comet Hunter F3.8 reflector, and, uh, and then the missing objects in the notes. Um, in 1980, I once did an audio recording beforehand on how to find them. For me, it made sense, go off of this star and that star. And uh, I did that and just, did the audio recording, didn't use any charts or anything. Um, I began finding them from memory on my fourth one with 60 objects. I did something called the Messe, uh, Massive Marathon in, in 1981, in which I saw 599 objects in one night. I put together a list of galaxies, clusters, and nebula that, that I would normally pick up while comet hunting. and. Uh, it comes to 548 objects. And then you add the Messe objects, you get 658. And so I tried to see as many of them in one night as I could. It was a busy night. Every 52 seconds, I found a new object. Uh, no setting circles, I star hopped to all of them. Uh, and it was a very busy night. I had wanted to take a half hour break and got behind and just did it for 10 hours. Um, I also did it with the moon three days past full. I mentioned that. And uh, then I moved to Colfax, California, 1993, used a six inch reflector. Finally picked up 100, 
10 in 2001. I think that's the first time. And um, began doing it from memory uh, in 2003. And um, no star maps. And you know what? It's easier that way. You can do it faster because you're not turning on your flashlight and looking at a star map. A lot of people have go-to telescopes and they say, what about that? Well, we say, if you have a go-to telescope, use it. If that's how you find things, go ahead and use it. It's just that when you have a competition in an astronomy club and you have 60 people all doing the Messe Marathon, seems to me that those who have the go-to telescope should be in a different category than those of us who star hop. It usually doesn't make any difference unless you have a mostly cloudy sky. Those of us who like to star hop need to have a little bit of clear sky, five, 10 degrees around the object so that we can star hop to it. Those who have the go-to telescopes just push a button and the telescope points there and they just look through the telescope until an opening occurs and then they have the object. So it's a little bit easier that way. But if you have go-to and that's what you do, just go ahead and do that. Um, I did a lot of uh, Messe marathons this year using a lot of different instruments because I'm rewriting a book on the Messe marathon and I wanted to experience it using different telescopes because people use different telescopes, not just what I use. So I, I learned a lot from doing that. Now, there's other types of marathons that can be done too. Early on, someone did the photographic Messe marathon, probably the mid 19. 80s or late 80s, the first person photographed all the objects in one night. CCDs came next, and that's done kind of on a regular basis now. When you go do a Messe marathon with an astronomy club, there might be a couple people there all set up and they'll, they'll CCD it, and they'll usually find more than us doing it visually. The unaided eye Messe marathon, probably uh, 30, 40 of the objects can be seen with the unaided eye. Binoculars, uh, we've done that. The mini Messier marathons. Now, some clubs do something like this. They divide the year into four, and every four times a year they go out, and each time they see 25 to 30 objects. In the course of a whole year, you've seen all of them. The, the nice thing about that, it takes only an hour or two in the evening. And the objects are well placed. They're not down by the horizon or anything. Uh, just that if you have, if you're clotted out, you know, you just have to go out the next week or something. The city Messe Marathon, where you're dealing with light pollution, you can do the planet and Messe Marathon together in which you see all the planets in one night. I think you can still do that, although Uranus and Neptune are inching behind the sun, I think, in late March. You can make your own marathon. I know a guy who did globular clusters one March and over 100 globular clusters he imaged in one night. Massive marathon where you do hundreds or the Herschel marathon. The Caldwell marathon cannot be done on a single night because uh, some objects are very far north and some are very far south. You'd have to be in both hemispheres and even then on the same night uh, there's no single night in which all of them would be visible. I put together a Messe Marathon um, search sequence way back in 1979. This is, it hasn't changed much at all. And the one you usually see on the internet is based on this. We begin with M77, we end at M30, and everything in between. Uh, you can also get this free from my Looking Up with Don podcast number five download off of my website, donmakos.com. I began writing different booklets for it, and this is the original book I wrote in which I traced the stars off of the AAVSO atlas and uh, the star fields and typed up notes. That's a typewriter, not a computer. Uh, in which I typed up where all these objects would be and how to find them. And I used this for many years and I wrote, hand wrote a, a lot of notes in the margins, changed this, changed that, and uh, did not publish it and used it for many years. 
Then I published a book on the upper right, Messe Marathon Observer's Guide, Handbook, and Atlas, self-published it in 1994. Cambridge University Press came by and asked if they could do it. So they did it on the lower left, and they also translated it into Spanish. If you look closely at the Messe Marathon book by Cambridge on the lower left, when we were choosing the cover for the book, uh, they, I said, well, you, just, you know, you pick a, a, one of the charts in, in the book and put the chart on the front. We had a lot of ideas that went back and forth, but this was the chart they, they chose, the star map they chose. Now, look carefully, that's the constellation Leo there. Those are actually the Caldwell objects, because uh, we did put a Caldwell object map in the book, but the book's about the Messe objects, and they, they picked the wrong chart. I wrote to them, but I don't know if they ever got the email. So. It was published with the wrong map on the front. All right, we're going to be running the marathon here. I find that once we walk through it like this, it's not so scary. We take it a step at a time. As twilight descends, we go after the first six Messe objects. This is kind of critical. If you do this in up through about March 25th, March 20th, up until about March 20th, this is pretty easy. You get past March 20th to March 25th, 26th, 27th, some of these objects become a little difficult. Now there's a few search sequences that say start with M74. I used to try that. I would spend so much time on M74, other stuff would be setting. So we always begin with M77. M77 on the far left, compact galaxy. You can see it in twilight. It's a Seifert galaxy, high surface brightness. It's not in the zyotical light like the stuff to the right. So go after M77 first. It's near the equator. There's four stars that point to it. Boom, you get it done. Then comes probably the hardest object. If anyone's going to miss an object in the evening sky, it's M74. And M74 is difficult because even though it's about a 10th magnitude galaxy, it's seen uh, face on. The light is spread out over kind of a wide area. It's in your zyotical light area. It's within uh, eight degrees of the horizon. When it gets within five degrees of the horizon or four degrees of the horizon, almost nobody can see it no matter what size telescope you have. But that also depends upon the transparency of your atmosphere. So you wanna to get to that. And for the Messe Marathon, you, don't just, you can't just find it, but you actually have to see it. Enough photons have to come through the telescope to energize your eye and the brain, and you say, oh, I see it. So this, that's where M74 becomes a difficult object because there's been many times I've had it in the field of view, but I cannot see it. And so you wait and you keep tracking on it. And as it gets lower in the sky, the sky darkens. You're, you're fighting uh, the altitude, it's getting lower, more difficult, but the sky is also getting darker, which will increase contrast. There will eventually come a point where it might pop into view. In fact, usually it does. Um, just when the sky gets dark enough that it, you have enough contrast to pick it up. So you get M74. Next is M33. That's the second most missed object in the evening sky. The pinwheel galaxy, six and a half magnitude, but spread out over a degree. Uh, you can star hop over to it and it's big. It will fill your field of view in most every case, but you can pick it up. It is a little bit brighter toward the core and that makes it easier. Then over to M31, 32 and M110. M110 is the third most missed object in the evening sky. People can see M31 and M32, but M110 is fainter, about ninth magnitude, and more diffuse. It's not really uh, bright and with a bright center like 32. So um, these are your first six objects. If you get these first six objects, uh, the rest of the evening won't really be that, that difficult. 
Now we're gonna be working from right to left and higher in the sky. Pick up M52 and M103. Some search sequences put M52 and M103 in the morning sky. And you can pick it up in the morning sky because it will go, it's almost circumpolar. It will go underneath the pole and it will be rising, beginning to rise in your morning sky. So if you don't get 52 and M103 at this time, you can get it later. I like to get it now. We're kind of in the area. We're kind of warming up. They're not that hard. And um, if you get clotted out in the morning, you'll never see them. So 52, 103, then M76, this little dumbbell nebula. That can be difficult in binoculars because it's really tiny and it's kind of faint. Then M34 and then M45. Don't forget M45. And you might want to look at it through the telescope, even though it's a naked eye object so that you can say, I saw them all through the telescope. Some people begin with M45 because it's sometimes bright enough that you can see it before you can see anything else. You can do that if you want. Um, all right, now we've covered the first 11 objects. We now move toward the south. These are objects that will be setting not real soon, but let's get them before they get too low in the sky. So south of Orion, we have M79 globular cluster, then M42 and M43. Don't forget M43. It's only about a half a degree away from 42, and it is kind of a detached area of M42. And then M78. And then we have these open star clusters to the left of that, beginning with 41, 93, 46, and 47. Very different and side by side. M50 and then M48. And now we can move a little bit higher in the sky. You begin to crane your neck a bit uh, as we get higher up in the sky. M1, 35, uh, 38, 36, and 37. And now we make a fairly big jump to M44 and M67. By this time, you're 50, 60 degrees high in the sky. You found your first, you, you found a quarter of the objects already. We are going to ignore the Virgo group for a while. It hasn't fully risen very high. And besides, there's other objects we're going to see first. We're going to continue. We were at M44 and 67. Just continue on over to 95, 96, and 105. Um, near 105, there's another fainter galaxy, 33, 84. But 105 is the brighter of the two. And then M65 and M66 in Leo. And then we head to the left toward the north and get 81 and 82. Those are hard for me to find. There's not a lot of guideposts to that. Tony Hellas likes to show these at star parties, 81 and 82. So do other astronomers. I always have trouble finding them, but I find them. M108 and 97 as we go through the Big Dipper, 109, 40, uh, 106, which is just south of. Uh, M40 by about 10 degrees. And then we pick up M94, 63, 51, 101, and all the way down to the M102. By this time, M102, which is an hour and right ascension later than 101, will be in your northeastern sky. And then we head south of that to M64, 53, and M3. You're in the eastern sky now. Next, we're going to go to an area that some people have trouble with. You can do this area in about two or three minutes, or you can do it in two or three hours. And I've heard of people taking two or three hours to find these objects. When you first do it, it does take time. If you're familiar with your telescope, it makes it easier. If you know about how bright objects look in your telescope, if you have a field for your field of view in your telescope, uh, this becomes fairly easy. Now, the three ways in which we can attack this area is to come in from the right, uh, from Leo, and begin with M98 and work our way around. Another way that's been suggested is to come in from the left to M60, 59, and 58. You're picking up some of the brightest galaxies here, but you're beginning a little bit lower in your sky and working further up. Another way is just to zero on in on M84 and M86. These are two fairly prominent galaxies 
within a degree of each other running east and west. And from there, you go north and then back to that again, north uh, east and back again, and east and then south, always coming back to there as your starting point. The way in which I've chosen to do this, and it works, I think, best for a lot of people, is to come in from the right. The star Denebola is the one of the bright stars in Leo. And from there, we go six degrees to the left to another star, which is about uh, six magnitude. And from that star, we come back a little bit to M98. And then on the other side of that star and south to 99. Now, these are fairly faint galaxies, but they're the brightest ones in the area. So when you see them, you know you have them. And then we, we angle over a little bit and head north to M100. This has a fairly low surface brightness, but again, it's the brightest one in the area. Then you head further north, almost a little bit more than that distance that you just went, to M85, which is pretty prominent, stands out well, and there's a fainter galaxy next to it. From that, we head due south, about four degrees to M84 and M86. If you have an equatorial telescope, you just go south until you pick up these two galaxies. If you have a Dobsonian, you, you move it away from the North Star. A lot of these uh, search sequences were designed using uh, equatorial mount, right ascension declination. And with Dobsonian, it is harder. And uh, as I'm working on this new book, I'm working on some of those angles too. So here, here we found these first few objects. Now from M84 and M86, we go over to M87, and then head over to 89, 90, uh, Dom, Yeah? Wait, you did say you wanted to take a quick photo break? It's 9.05, 9.04. I got uh, 20 minutes. Okay, 18. sorry. Thank you. I'll be done by then. Um, 84 to 87, then 89 and 90. Now, 89 and 90 are kind of faint. You might want to preview this before the marathon. There are some other galaxies in there, but they're not as bright as 89 and 90. Then we go up to M88, which is pretty bright, and hop over to 91, a bit dimmer. That was the missing object. And then head down through M90, keep going to M58. M58 is fairly bright as is 59 and 60. Now we have uh, two more in this area, M49 and M61. Whenever I do the marathon, these take me a while because now you're going back in the opposite direction, heading south and, and going three or four degrees at a time. M49 and M61. Now, now we're in the south eastern sky. We pick up M104 and, and then drop down below Corvus for the globular cluster M68. Usually at that time, if, if I'm doing the marathon and I'm an hour and a half in uh, since twilight, I've picked up just about everything that I can see. I've got like 65, 66 objects. And I'll usually go to bed, then get up about 2 a.m. and begin with M83, which now has moved across the sky and will be either due south or a little bit west of south. M83 is a pretty bright galaxy, but there's nothing real bright nearby. Now, now we go for some globular clusters. M5, and these are fairly bright. M5, M13, M92, and these will be in your eastern sky. M57, we learned about that earlier tonight. M56. M29 and 39, M27 and M71. So we're kind of in the northeastern sky at this point. We have these five globular clusters here, M12, 10, and 14. You can go in almost any order, but this is the order that I find works best for me. And now we get into Scorpius. Um, it's after 2 a.m. usually, uh, before this will get high enough that you can see all of these objects. 
M M80, M4, M19, and 62. Uh, all of them are globulars. And then the two open star clusters, M6 and M7. These are really far south, and uh, you might have to wait a bit until they rise. This is one of my favorite stretches. We're just going down the back of the summer Milky Way. M11 over the M26. Now, M26 in a large telescope can be difficult because it tends to blend in with everything else. Then 16, 17, 18, which is an open cluster, then M24, which is that star cloud. From M24, you go a few degrees uh, to the west, of M23, an open cluster, and then back through M24, and then a few degrees to the east for M25. And then 21, which is an open cluster, M20, the Trifed, and M8, the Lagoon Nebula. I tried doing that a few months ago in March when the moon was right near M20, and I really had a lot of trouble seeing M20 with the moon next to it. So dark skies certainly help. Oh, then M28 and M22 uh, at the bottom. Now we're really far south, and if you live far north, these will become a bit more difficult because we're within an hour of twilight. And M69 and 70 and 54, fairly far south. M55 doesn't rise for a while. Now, M55 is a big globular cluster, about five and a half magnitude, but the light spread out over quite an area. And it doesn't rise real soon either. It rises kind of late in the morning here. And then over to M75. M75 is a tiny globular. Uh, under low magnification, you could mistake it for a star. Now we have a couple bright globulars in the east. And these are the last objects we're going to see due east because we're heading uh, south for the last three. So M15 and M2, <coughs> um, one is uh, due south of the other. And then M72 and M73. M72 is a globular cluster but it's diffuse and it tends to blend in with the background. So M72 can be a problem in the morning sky. M73 are those four stars, fairly compact, uh, but they do appear kind of fuzzy under low magnification. And then they're about a degree away from M72. Now the final object is M30. If you do the Messe Marathon after March 25th, give M30 a try. Uh, by April 1st, it should be visible. Anytime after that, fairly easily visible. Um, but then final logic then would be M30. When people do the Messe Marathon and they only get 109 objects, almost all the time it's M30 they do not see. And if you do it before March 25th, you, you know going in, I'm only going to get 109 and that's fine. You still have a great night. No matter how many objects you see, uh, some people who do the Messe Marathon haven't seen some of those objects in their whole life before, so it's the first time they've seen them. It's new to them and exciting to them. Those of us who do 100 objects or so, it's refreshing in the morning to think back through the night. I don't always have that great of a memory on things, but you know, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I can think back to when I saw M46 and what it looked like, and M42 and what it looked like. And I'll know how, I can tell you how easy or difficult it was to see M74 uh, near the beginning of the evening. And I can describe to you what 65 and 66 were like that night. In one night, I've seen this whole menu of objects. Um, and it's really amazing to see so many different objects in one night. Uh, it's, it's all compressed like that. It, it's very amazing. So at the end of it all, you're, you're tired, you want to go to bed, and, and that's the, the, uh, the Messe Marathon. Um, people who finished it look forward usually to the next one. Do we have any questions? Just a comment. Yes. M72 nearly drove me to quit the hobby. <laughs> <laughs> It can be that way, yeah. It tends to blend in, right? Yeah, I was a, I was, it was my first, it was an eight-inch 
completely manual Dobsonian. So I had that and turn left at Orion. And I looked and I looked and I looked. And it's a good thing there was no dumpster nearby because my table, books, eyepieces, and scope all would have gone into it in a rage. But I did find it eventually. I kept at it. And, no, I was, and then I blurted out, that's it? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> well, what is, when you don't find it for a while and you finally find it, you kind of say that. That's it? M57 was like that for me with my two-inch refractor in Concord, California in 1965. It took me three nights to find it. And um, it was because it was so tiny. It was like an out of focus star at 40 power and even 75 power. So I kept sweeping over it. And, and finally I realized, oh, that's it. It was a big eureka moment for me finding M57. Other comments or questions? What, uh, can, can you comment on, on the quality of telescope that Messier was using when he discovered all these things? Yes, yeah, so a three inch uh, gave fairly good images. Um, it was on an alt azimuth mount, and the the six inch I believe was a uh, alt azimuth mount also, uh, but the optics weren't quite as good. It gathered more light, but it was a definition apparently wasn't that good. John, what would be a recommended starter scope or pair of binoculars to use? Pair of binoculars, um, you mean for the Messe Marathon, someone who already knows a little bit about the sky? Yes, sir. 11 by 80s might be a little bit weak on magnification unless you have a fairly dark sky. M76 will be difficult, for instance, and some of the Virgo galaxies might be a little difficult. Probably better would be 20 by 80s uh, on a tripod. Um, I've done it with those. It can be done with those. Uh, telescope. I've seen people do it with a four inch telescope. Um, I used a four inch, three and a half inch finder uh, a few months ago with my big binoculars and, and seeing them in the finder was amazing. Most of them, almost all of them can be seen in a uh, three inch finder, even the fainter galaxies under fairly dark skies. Now, if you're going to add some light pollution to it or some inexperience to it, then a larger telescope is usually necessary to pull it out and understand what it is you're seeing. Nicholas here. Uh, I have a question about the comet that carries your name. How, how did you discover it? And you know, can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, which one? Um, isn't the C two thousand four Q two? Okay, that was my tenth comet. Uh, I picked that one up from my backyard and. Colfax, California with a six inch reflector uh, dinoscope. And the reason I was using my deck was because I was covering the southern sky, which I couldn't see quite as well through the observatory. I picked it up on August 27th, 2004. Um, 10 and a half, 11th magnitude, uh, two hours, 20 minutes, uh, minus 22 degrees or so. There's a few galaxies kind of in that area, but when I picked it up, I pretty sure there was nothing in that area. Uh, it was confirmed within a day and uh, they realized it would be coming in pretty close uh, to the sun. It passed by the Pleiades on January 7th, 2005. Good photo opportunity for everyone who had clear skies and we did not in, in California that day. Um, and it had a, a bright absolute magnitude of I think two or three. So it reached a uh, third and a half magnitude. It was a naked eye object for about three months, two or three months. It, it, it was a well-observed comet. And, and is that, that, that's the comet that carries your name, right? Yes, well, there's, uh, I've discovered 12 comets that carry my name. Uh, that was my 10th. The last one I found was in November 7th, 2018 from Colfax using the eight, eight, uh, 18 inch telescope. And that was the first visual comet discovery in eight years. And uh, there was also coal discovered by two Japanese observers who were using CCDs. So they picked it up, I picked it up visually and then they picked it up with CCDs. All three of us got our names on it. I found my first one back in 1978. How were you able to compete with the, uh, you know, with all the automated uh, comet hunting scopes? It's very difficult. Yeah. That's why it's been eight years uh, between visual discoveries. Almost no one's visually discovering anyway. 
uh, visually observing, uh, trying to discover them anyway. Uh, there's some amateurs who do CCDs. There are ways around it. There are comets that can sneak through their search areas. And the one we found, I found in 2018 did, the one I found in 2010 did, the one in 2004 came out from behind the sun, um, moved fairly quickly and brightened rapidly. So um, it was in an area they were not yet covering. Now they would be covering that area. So I cover closer to the sun than they do. I'm also competing against SWAN which is on the SOHO satellite. And that goes down to about 10th magnitude for most of the sky, including areas near the sun that the asteroid guys don't look. And um, I search the areas that SWAN cannot cover too, which are pretty close to the sun, within 18 degrees of the sun or so, which is pretty low in the sky near twilight. I think that visually we can still discover comets, but it will be rare. Well, hang in there, man. Keep fighting. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much. This was amazing. Uh, I'm going to Amazon. I'm ordering your book. All right. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> and for my, for my friends in Mexico, I'm ordering the Spanish version, too, if it's still in print. There's also an e-version available, too, from what oh, I hear. Okay. All right. All right. Well, good. Thank you.